Okay. Um, my name is Brian Lees, and I'm a senior toxicologist with Stantec, and I'm the, hopefully tall enough that you can see me down here because I tend to wander. Uh, I'm the senior toxicologist and lead for the human health and ecological risk assessment component of the EA submission for the AJAX project, uh, or the HHERA, or HERA, as it often gets called. Okay, just briefly to give you some idea what we're going to cover. I'll give you an overview of what the HHERA process is. It might make the rest of it a little easier. Talk a little bit about the regulatory framework that governs how these studies are actually done. Because it's important to understand that we're not making this up as we go along. This, in fact, is all laid out by federal and provincial regulators, okay? We'll talk about the basic components of an HHERA so you understand essentially what we're talking about. Then we'll spend a little bit of time going through how we apply all of this to the AJAX project for both the baseline and the effects assessment. And then finally, how we actually interpret the results, right? Which is really, I think, the important part. Let's make sure I get this right. Okay, what is a human health and ecological risk assessment? Essentially, it's a process that answers three very basic questions. Is there a risk? If the answer to that is yes, the next question is, well, what kind of risk is it? Is it a human health risk? Is it an ecological risk? Or is it both? Okay, and finally, again, if the answer is yes, how big is the risk? Is it really big? Is it really small? We need to know. That's all this process does. Okay? It's full of math. It looks really slick. It's, but it, that's all it does. That's all it's intended to do. Okay? There are regulatory frameworks for doing these things. Most of it comes from federal guidance, either here in Canada, through Health Canada and Environment Canada, or from the US EPA, who really developed the process to deal with their Superfund sites in the States back in the early, early to mid-1980s. Okay? Provincial regulators here in BC, Alberta, Ontario, most of the provinces have their own processes for doing exactly the same thing. They're all generally come from the US EPA. Now, the other point I think I want to make at this point, I'm going to do a little bit of a sidebar. You all understand that Health Canada comes up with drinking water quality guidelines and that there are soil quality guidelines that tell you, you know, what it's safe to have in drinking water, what it's safe to have in residential soil, what it's safe to have in food. Those numbers are derived by the federal and provincial agencies using exactly the same process that we're talking about tonight. Okay, we're not doing anything different here than the feds are doing. Okay? When they come up with safe guidelines for drinking water, or they come up with safe guidelines, you know, allowable chemical levels in soil for residential properties, for industrial properties, air quality guidelines are doing exactly the same thing that we're doing here. Okay? The basic process is relatively straightforward. You start off with something that's called the problem formulation. Okay? What that does, if we can get this to work, really it identifies the chemicals of concern, the things you're going to be looking at. Okay? It helps you identify the people and the animals that are likely to be exposed to whatever these chemicals are up here. It tells you how those people and animals are actually going to be exposed to the things that you've got. And these two ones in blue are used to define what's called the conceptual site model, or in typical HHERA terms, the CSMs. And I'll show you what they look like in a couple of minutes. It also identifies the regulatory allowable exposure limits, OK, right over here. And these are the allowable daily exposure levels that are set by Health Canada or Environment Canada. From a human health perspective, these are set by Health Canada. And what they mean, or what they represent, are the daily exposures you can have in milligrams per kilogram per day 
every day of your life, and as long as your exposures are below those, Health Canada is convinced you do not have a health concern. Okay? We're not making these numbers up. The numbers we use in this process come directly from federal agencies. And if they're not available from federal agencies here, the federal agencies here tell us, go to the states. That's where you're going to find them. Okay? So we're not inventing this. Okay? We're not inventing any of this. What the process does then is it estimates exposures. And within an HHERA for an environmental assessment, you have to do this part twice. You do it once for baseline, where you estimate what exposures currently are in the community, whether that's to chemicals in the soil, chemicals in the food, chemicals in game, chemicals in fish, chemicals in drinking water, chemicals in air. Okay? And you compare those exposures to the allowable exposure limits that you've already identified that the regulators have told you you must use. Okay? So you do that for the baseline, which is based on measured concentration, so that's measured air quality, measured water quality, measured soil quality, measured metal concentrations in, in, in veggies, metal concentrations in country food, in fish, whatever you can get your hands on that's in the area, okay? Then, you do all those calculations again for the various project phases, okay? These, unfortunately, because the project does not exist, we do not have the luxury of actually going out and measuring. So we can't do these using measured data. That has to be based on model data, which is why the work that the HHERA does relies heavily on the air quality predictive modeling, the water quality predictive modeling, the health, the, the effects we get from the terrestrial effects, of vegetation, all that stuff. All of those other people are busily beavering away producing their own reports. I sit at my desk, lazy as stink until it all comes in, then I get it all on my desk, I go through it, and I sort it out, plug it into the human health and ecological risk assessment so that I can do this part of the work that I do. Okay? That feeds into the risk characterization where you start to make comparisons between what's going on in baseline and what's going on for the various project phases. All of that gets documented including rather large discussions of the uncertainty and the effect that the uncertainty has on the conclusions that you draw. And that gets put into the environmental assessment report and off it goes to the feds for rigorous review. This is just an example of a human health conceptual site model. Okay, oh, you want me to use this one so you can see the pointer. Essentially, all this does is it just gives you a graphic representation of the kinds of things that you think might be exposure pathways. So if you've got dust deposition to soil, from that you've got people eating soil, you've got people getting soil on their skin, dermal uptake of chemicals through the skin, into vegetation, maybe down into the groundwater, into the drinking water, into the fish. You try to identify as many possible exposure pathways as you can and evaluate all of them. Because what you don't want to do, what's completely unacceptable in this process, is underestimating exposure. It's okay to overestimate it. That's not a problem at all, right? You can't underestimate it. It's just not acceptable. Okay. This is just a show. Most of what we'll talk about tonight is based on the human health component of the HHERA. The same process is used for the ecological side of it you're just looking at different receptors. Rather than looking at humans, you're looking at plants and animals. But the process is the same. So we've got a conceptual site model here for ecological receptors. Gives you an idea of how you think contaminants are going to move through the food chain so you know how to model them. So you identify ecological risks in the same way that you identify human health risks. Okay. As I've said before, there's nothing new about the process that we're using here, okay? There are some examples here of where these things are typically used.
we got projects in Newfoundland, New Brunswick, Ontario, Alberta. We've got here in BC, I know of at least five coal mine projects where this process is being used. Four additional copper, gold, or base, me or base metal mines where it's being used. It's certainly being used in Nunavut and the Northwest Territories all over. It's a standard and well accepted process. Okay, that's the base work. So how do we fit all of this into Ajax? Well, looking at the human health side of it, for now, we do exactly what the federal and provincial regulators expect us to do. We will look at all of the age groups for people, everything from infants through to seniors, including sensitive subgroups. That could include the elderly, pregnant women, very young children. And we're looking at, at this point, the ant we're anticipating looking at four different groups in this area. Kamloops residents, First Nations, residents who live outside of Kamloops, and ranchers. And the reason we sort of distinguish between residents outside of Kamloops and ranchers is we want to make sure that if there's any difference between these two in the amount of locally grown food that they eat, that we capture that and we account for that in the process. Okay, because again, we want to make sure that we're overestimating and not underestimating. In terms of the exposure pathways that we expect to be looking at from inhalation related to the various project phases, for inhalation, because with inhalation what you're concerned about are air quality or air concentrations on, a, on an hourly or, or a, a more immediate basis rather than a chronic basis. We are going to look at inhalation exposures for baseline conditions, certainly. And then for construction, operations, closure, and post-closure. Okay? For the other potential pathways for soil contact, and that really includes incidental soil ingestion and dermal contact with soil. Okay? Drinking water, produce consumption, and country food consumption, which in this case for us is, includes fish, game, birds, vegetation, and the use of traditional medicines. We are going to look at baseline conditions. What's going on now? What's going on in the community or these various communities now? What are the exposures that they're experiencing now? And we're going to look at post-closure. Because these last four are all driven by dust deposition and a chemical accumulation in the soil, what you want to look at is the part of the project where those concentrations are highest. And that will be post-closure. Okay? As long as dust deposition is continuing, metal concentrations in the soil will continue to increase. So we can go ahead and we can look at all of these for construction, all of these for operations, and all of these for closure, as well as post-closure. We can do that. But the reality is that this is the one that's going to give us the highest results. So that's the one that we look at. If this one shows that there are no issues, we know that there won't be any issues with the others. If this one does say that there are concerns that need to be addressed, then you de de develop the necessary mitigative measures to address these. And if you address these, by default, you address the rest of these. Okay? That's why this is broken up. Just five minutes? Oh, God, OK. OK, let's motor through this a little bit quicker. Uh, hopefully, it'll come together a little bit better. Uh, the things we're going to be looking at are total, part, uh, total suspended particulate, PM10 and 2.5, NOx, SOx, SO2, CO, PAHs, and metals. And that was supposed to go, but it didn't. Okay, for the baseline, okay, the exposures are going to be estimated for each of the receptor age groups that we looked at for each of these pathways. Okay? Those exposures are going to be estimated based on the baseline concentrations that have been measured in soil, country foods, water, whatever. The exposure calculations that we use are going to be consistent with what Health Canada expects, 
with what the US EPA would expect, what the BC Minister of the Environment would expect. Okay? Once we've got that, we'll look at taking everybody's exposure from drinking water, from soil, from country food, summing that up to give us a total exposure for each receptor, for each chemical. Okay? Those total exposure estimates will be compared to the allowable exposure limits that have been set by Health Canada, which we talked about early on. Those are the benchmarks that we have to use that the government says as long as your exposures are below those, the government is not concerned about the exposure. Okay? The baseline is going to be used in comparison. So really what we're doing, from the baseline what you'll get is this, is a graph that takes a look at soil ingestion, dermal contact, uh, backyard garden produce, the game, uh, and traditional medicines. All of these components are in here. It'll give you a stack total exposure. That'll get compared to the allowable exposure limit to see whether or not you're above or below the limit. Okay? For the effects assessment, everything stays the same. All of the equations, all of the assumptions, all of the consumption rate assumptions, all of that stays the same except the chemical concentrations, okay? In the baseline, as I said, those chemical concentrations are measured. We have the luxury of actually going out and measuring those things now. For the project, we have to look at model concentrations. So the only thing we're changing in all of those equations are the input numbers we use for the chemical concentrations, okay? So for the project, the H, as I said before, the HHERA is going to integrate all of the effects assessments from the air quality, the water quality, the terrestrial effects, all of that will get integrated. We'll use that to generate our estimates of chemical concentrations that we use to estimate the exposures. Okay? The exposures are going to be the same as the base, the calculations are the same as baseline. We do exactly the same thing. We sum those to give us total exposures and then compare those. And what we start with doing is there's our baseline. There's construction, operations, closure, and post-closure. So what we're trying to do is figure out how things are changing as time goes by. Uh, as I said, really what we're going to be looking at are the first and the last ones. But what we're trying to do is decide whether or not all of these exposures, in fact, are above or below the allowable exposure limit. Okay? If they're below, what you're trying to decide is how much change in exposure is there between baseline, which is here, and post-closure, which is up here, okay? Baseline over here, post-closure here. And are we seeing a change that looks like this? Or are we seeing a change that looks like this, okay? For this, it's relatively straightforward. Even in this case, because we're below the allowable exposure limit, we're okay. The regulators would not have a concern with that level of exposure. But what do we do when we have this case, when our baseline is already above the allowable exposure limit? How do we handle that? Okay, This is where understanding how much change there is between baseline and post-closure becomes much more important. Okay. The way this is done, or the way the regulators want this done, is they say that if there's anything less than a 20% change in exposure above baseline, which is consistent with how they handle their own federally contaminated sites, okay, then they don't have a concern. So, whoops, my apologies. As long as this change here is less than 20% above this, federal regulators do not have a concern. Okay? And we can spend some time talking about how you actually interpret this. Okay? I'm not sure if looking at this and thinking baseline is above an allowable limit actually tells everybody, oh, things are not good, or if it actually tells them that maybe this process is a little bit too conservative and we've overestimated exposure, which is likely to be the case. Or 
that the allowable daily limit set by the regulators may not actually reflect reality. And this is a really classic case with nickel. If you look at nickel and take a look at what the allowable daily intake for nickel used to be, and then took a look at what you estimated a toddler's intake from baby food was, the baby food blew them over the allowable daily intake. Okay? Because the allowable daily intake for nickel is incorrectly calculated. So you have to be very careful when you get to this situation. Two minutes? I don't need two minutes now. Okay. So what you're going to get in terms of an HHERA report, and I apologize, I'm supposed to be using this screen and I keep forgetting. Uh, the main HHERA report, which contains all of the things that we've been talking about, there'll be a bunch of technical appendices which sound really boring. Uh, the summaries of all the data that we use for the baseline, the summaries of all the data we use for the project effects, all of the soil, vegetation, and tissue samples that have been collected as part of the HHERA baseline. The important one, or the important two, are these last two. The HHERA will contain detailed exposure calculations for each chemical for each human receptor. This appendix will probably be, I'm going to guess, 1,500 to 2,000 pages long, okay? We will give you everything you need except the hydro and the spreadsheet to sit down and take our numbers from the start all the way through to the end so that you can get the same numbers that we get once we agree that everybody agrees on the math then we can argue about the assumptions that got us there, okay? But the critical point for this, from a matter of transparency, is you have to have those numbers so you can reproduce the numbers that I do to keep me honest, okay? There will also be an independent peer review, and those comments will be an appendix to the report. Included with that will be our responses to those comments and an indication of what changes have been made to the document to respond to those comments. And they aren't all just going to be going pound sand. Okay? And I think that's done. Great. Well, thanks, Brian, for uh, staying with us. Last presentation is always oh, difficult fun. to keep the energy level up, go but grab the information was yep. great. So questions, please. No, I'm not going to grab water. I finished. I guess the question okay. is yeah. with regard to a statement that appeared in the dispersion modeling plan. And the statement is, Stantec senior toxicologist selected the substances to model from assay results provided by CAM. These include trace elements in the ore, waste rock, and thickened tailings. Oh, great. Um, were you that senior toxicologist who selected or who analyzed the assay results? I was part of the group that did that, yes. Okay. Um, my next question is with regard to the assay results. I think you just said it. The assay results will be provided no, in the no, application? No, no. I didn't say that the assay results would be provided. As far as I understand, that, that, that those results are proprietary. Okay. What, what you will have in the HHERA report okay, is lists of the soil, mm -hmm. air, water, quality data that have got all of the okay. concentrations for the various trace metals there. In terms of the ore itself, no, that won't be there because that's not part of what we do. We'll take the air dispersion modeling. They will give us metal concentrations in the dust mm -hmm. as it falls to the various receptor locations. Each one of those grid locations use that to estimate metal concentrations at those locations and use that to estimate. So perhaps somebody else in the room from KGHM could answer the question with regard to the assay data. Will that assay data be disclosed at the application stage, or has it already been dis disclosed? I, I'll field this one because I can't, I, I can't answer that. Yeah, let me, is this on? Yeah, let me address that one. Um, 
and I think it goes back to a comment that I made earlier. And, and the comment that I said up front was, you have to realize that we're early in this process. And this process is a, a process that's managed by both the federal and provincial government. So we do provide information to them. And then you know how that kind of information gets put to the public would really be their decision. But thank you for the question. But you do have assay data that has not been made public yet. Is that correct? Yeah, the, the, the data that we have that would be made public would have to go to the government first. So, so the, the path that would happen is, if we have any results, but it's going to come in the form of a report, mm -hmm. it would go to the government for review, and then that information would be made public. Yeah. The statement says that there are assay results provided by CAM. So I assume there is assay data. And my question is, has that assay data been disclosed? Yeah, I'm not familiar with that. You don't know? I don't know. I'm just, I'm just pointing out what the process is. Could you find is. out? Sure. Yep. Because I would assume that the assay data is owned by Abacus and the parent company, or KG, KGHM International, which is controlled by KGHM Polska Meats, mm -hmm. correct? That's correct. And there are disclosure requirements? Right. All, all I was pointing out is the process. Mm -hmm. So thanks for the question. We'll find out. But the process is, if we have information that's okay. disclosed, it would be, because, because we're in an environmental assessment mm -hmm. process, that's the process that we're in, and that process is managed by the government, that we have to go through them to release public information. Will you be able to provide that answer before the sessions are over, like by the end of this, this week? We'll try. Thanks. So thanks for the question. Thank you. Next question. <clears throat> First of all, thank you for your presentation. And I want to appreciate the fact that you're an expert in toxicology, and I appreciate that. I just wanted to say that I understand the process that you've laid out, but I'd also like to add in the fact that while this may be what happens in Canada, what happens worldwide with larger projects is a health impact assessment, which is a much more robust and rigorous and comprehensive process than what you've just described. Ah. So, no, let me finish. Yep, absolutely. So, and when I look at the National Research Council and I look at the reviews of projects around the world that have been assessed, Canada does not get a real passing mark. Um, we fall far, far short of what we should be doing when you look at the Swedish countries and Australia and several other countries around the world that have actually embraced the health impact assessment. So, I just wanted to make that comment and I also wanted to make the okay. comment that one of the problems with what you've outlaid is the same problem we've already seen in the room tonight, is that there's a lack, the health impact assessment is based on an integrated approach among specialties. Okay. Can, I, can I respond to the first part? Sure. First? What we've talked about tonight in terms of an HHERA yeah. is one component of a health impact assessment. Mm -hmm. It is not a health impact assessment, yeah. nor does it ever pretend to be a right. health impact assessment. The integrated components that you're talking about that mm -hmm. form part of a health impact assessment bring in socioeconomic considerations, uh, uh, psychosocial considerations. Those areas are in fact being addressed as other parts of this EA submission. So while it is not being called a health impact assessment, the components of that are in fact part of the EA submission. So to say that it's not being done is not correct. To say that it's not being called a health impact assessment is fair. To say that all of the components that are used to integrate together to come to the final component or the final decision are not being considered is not correct. Well, it is correct to say that it's not being integrated. It's also correct to say that it's not being done by all neutral parties. And it should be an independent neutral process. So I have no confidence, and I'm just saying this out loud so that the members of KGHM know, I have no confidence that you're going to integrate it properly. I have no, in I have no confidence that it's going to be done in a necessarily unbiased fashion. Because when you look at medical research, the standard is to do it in a blinded fashion or to do it with independent neutral parties that have absolutely no um, bias or could have no potential bias. 
So I just wanted to say that you know, it needs to be, to be taken to the next level. What we've been asking for from the Kamloops Physicians for a Healthy Environment is a neutral, independent health impact assessment. I appreciate the fact that your expertise in your area, and I appreciate that. I appreciate the fact that you're going by federal standards, but we all know that health doesn't have a set guideline. And we also know that federal standards are also widely impacted a lot of times by political aspirations. So they're not always necessarily in the public's best interest. They're also not necessarily up to date and can be very old, much like our you know, Mineral Tenure Act, which is 150 years old. So you know, when you do a health impact assessment and you actually have people sitting in the room that are very knowledgeable in their areas, they actually use the most up to date information to make those assessments on, based on health and whether it will impact us, which is why we're asking for that. I just wanted to make that clear. Um, I think that's basically all of my comments, but I do appreciate your um, efforts and your part of the toxicology. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Next question, please. Hi. Um, could you go back to the part where you talked about 20% um, of something? I kind of didn't understand that part. Okay. That is not a, not a huge surprise. It's a difficult concept <clears throat> to get. The way it works, let, let's, let, let's back up a minute here. Let's go to this one, okay, where the project and, where did I put the pointer? What we have is a situation where baseline is well below whatever this bright line is that has been set by federal agencies. You do all of the calculations, you look at the project, and even when you add all of the project stuff in, you're still below. So you're below the allowable limit. Yes, it's more than it was before but it's not a concern. The feds wouldn't think that was a concern. The issue becomes, let's try and do this two-handed, when we get to this situation where essentially what's going on now would suggest that maybe exposures are rolled above what the federal agencies would say was acceptable. If you just simply base the decision about how big an effect anything is going to have, you're dead in the water before you start because you're already above whatever this line is that the feds have set. So in order to determine whether or not this increase would be considered acceptable, what the process does is it defaults back to the federal approach for dealing with federal contaminated sites, where it says as long as the exposure to a chemical from a federally contaminated site is less than 20% of the allowable exposure or less than 20% above benchmark baseline, it's considered to be acceptable. So that's what that's saying. So if people are already being affected by uh, a contaminant no, no. in an that's, environment? That's, nope. We're all exposed to contam contam chemicals all the time, right? It's just, it, 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 it's a fact of life. One of your largest exposures is going to be to nickel, and nickel comes from processed food because it's used in all of the stainless steel, okay? It's, it's, it's just the way it is. It doesn't mean it's right, it's just it's reality, okay? Okay, so thank you for um, is, is working that? through that. I, I'm not really sure if I'm all up on that, but what I would like to do is go back to the slide where um, you had to move along uh, more quickly, and down at the bottom it had a list of the metals. Um, I think it did anyways, but it was whisked away before I had a chance to really see. Yeah. Okay, um, so arsenic, cadmium, cobalt, copper, lead, mercury, Molybdenum, nickel, nickel, and selenium. Yep. I think a fellow over there mentioned selenium, didn't he? Or did he? I can't remember something. Sulfur. Sulfur. This gentleman earlier was talking about sulfur oxides. That's right. Okay. So um, the metals include those, and you're not saying that there's any others than no, those? No. I think at this point it's safe to say that these are, the thi these are certainly some of the things that we would expect to, to be in there. Okay. Some of the ones that would be expected. 
Okay. These, these are the ones that would typically show up. At that site? No, these were the ones that would typically show up in this type of development. Oh, okay. 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 Um, byproducts of the actual... Um... No, th these are the... For this kind of mine, these are the metals that typically show up in the ore. Now, a lot of these are there uh, usually in very trace amounts. Mm -hmm. But these, these are the ones that often show up. So that may be the list. It may be longer. Okay. I wouldn't expect yeah. it to be shorter, but it could be longer. So um, my, my, um, my question is, um, you talk a lot about safe levels and allowable limits. And um, I met a doctor not too long ago who said there are no safe levels, for example, of uranium. And I've known that uranium is not an uncommon uh, part of the soils. Uh, and actually, I've been told BC's loaded with it. Um, I think Kelowna was almost going to have a uranium mine, and then the Minister of Mines said, no, at the last minute, stop, let's not do that. Um, so uranium is obviously concerning. Um, and I did learn um, from uh, somebody who actually had a look through a document that's available by the Ministry of Mines. It's a core log data um, that is not detailed assay, but gives a clue as to what should be looked for at the site um, where the mine is planned. And um, it's a 2009 report, and I was told by this person who um, is a very, obviously, very patient person, because it's about a 2,700-some-odd page yeah. report. They often are. Um, in that report, he found that there were seven measurable, uh, seven uh, drill holes that showed measurable uranium. And my th thinking is that if a doctor says there are no safe levels of uranium, um, if there is uranium to be found at that site, and if it is going to be blasted, um, we don't know at which end of the pit, at which depth of the pit, ultimately, um, I know that uranium has uh, adverse um, qualities against uh, reproductive organs. I have small children, uh, in fact, two little girls, and they dream of being mothers one day. Um, at one of the last uh, KGHM uh, open houses, I actually went up to a couple of the big fellows that are mining guys down in the States, and I said to them, do you have uranium near in the sites where you're mining? And they said no. Both of them said no. And I said, well, do you know anything about uranium that's in the ground where mining could happen here? And they said, oh, no, we don't know anything about that. And I said, well, here's the thing. I want to know for my little girls if they want to have babies one day, if 23 years of being exposed to who knows how much uranium over what period of time on, by respirable PM 2.5 particulates, um, will their uteruses work? And these mining men were kind of like, oh my gosh, she just said uterus. Um, but really, they were kind of uncomfortable. And the bottom line is this. I cannot see, you talk about risks, you talk about um, cumulative effects, heavy metals get into the body, they never go away. Well, no, so, that's not quite true. They do. Uh, but oh, they do. Heavy metals can oh, yeah. find a way out of the body. Oh, absolutely. Okay. So um, there was the uranium thing, and then there's all they never go away. I've just been learning is an output from our pulp mill. And so I wondered if chromium-6 is a problem from the pulp mill, and chromium-6 has a possibility of being formed through blasting and or grinding of various uh, components at this mine site, would chromium-6 then be added to the existing chromium-6, which also works against my children's reproductive organs? I, I, I am not a geochemist. So I okay, you're not a geochemist. No, no, no. no. I'm just but you're a toxicologist. Yeah. So you know about toxins and bodies and stuff. A little bit. I'm not a, I'm not a toxicologist yeah. or a geologist. I don't know uh, very much I, about yeah, chemistry I'm, at all. I'm not a geochemist, so I don't know about chromium-6 in terms of its generation. What I do know about chromium-6 is that it's very, it has a very short environmental half-life and is very quickly converted to chromium-3. So... Uh, it can be made from chromium-3 by grinding it or exploding it with usually, other things? No, it's, it, it, I'm not a geochemist, so I'm not going to... I'm but, not either. I just I, have learned little bits and pieces. Yeah, so. I, I, I just am concerned about if there is a chromium-6 output and will that baseline measure in Kamloops be something that's taken into consideration if there's a possibility of a chromium-6 output in, from the mine. In, in terms of finding chrome-6 environmentally, you find it in areas where there has been electroplating. It's used in, 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 in chrome plating. 
environmentally, it converts very quickly to Chrome 3. If Chrome 3 is part of this, if Chrome in general, Chrome, hex Chrome, Chrome 6 or uh, Chrome 3 is part of this, and certainly it will be on that list. Whether it will, whether it's on that, I, at this point, I don't know. So it might be on that list along it, with, like, for oh, instance, Chromium 3 and aspects of our soil, like um, high levels of alkalinity, um, manganese, um, mm -hmm. and um, I think calcium is the other one, that those things together create hexavalent chromium. So I just, I, I don't know, I don't know these things, I just start learning and then I know that they have an effect on my children that's over 23 years, it's cumulative, so. Possibly. Yeah, well, yeah if, if, if that shows up as being, if it's something the geochemists say we need to look at, then certainly that gets put into this, which is why I'm saying this list. So it's not it's, you who decides what will be studied, it's the geotech tech person? It, it's a combination. In, okay. in, in order for me to identify the chemicals that I think need to be carried through a human health and ecological risk assessment, I need to know what the chemicals are that are there or that are likely to be there. So you learn that from the geotech person? Well, the geochemists. Geochemist person. The geochemists. So, and there is one of those in this project? Uh, there will be several, yes. Okay. Yeah, there will be several. So it wouldn't just be decided by a toxicologist because they don't have that exact uh, information? No, it would not be decided by me. Okay. No, I mean, one, one thing I pointed out earlier is it's, it's reviewed and decided by the government, right? So all, all this type of information, um, especially on important topics like this, we'll have a primary consultant prepare it, We'll have a third party review, just like we're doing with the air model. And then, of course, it's reviewed by the federal government in the province. So the decision I, doesn't no, yeah. rest with Brian, obviously. There's yeah. A person has to involved. wonder what comes first, the chicken the or the egg, right? Well, because what you submit to them, they decide is to be studied, or they decide what needs to be studied, and they ask no, you to look it, for it. Like, it's kind of like who's really in control of the, what's going to be studied the, 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 in the, the end. The, the first cut is the geochemists will tell us what's likely to be there. From that, we decide which we think are the ones that are important to look at for human health and ecological. Concerns. So would you say that uranium, if it's there, should be let known so that people can say, hey, I just don't want to live next to where that's going to be blasted into the air? That, was going to, that will depend on, there are several things that go into making that decision, but if it's part of it, it will go through the same selection process that everything else goes through. That selection process is spelled out in the risk assessment so that when we get to the things that we think need to be carried through, we do all of that it goes to the government. The government looks at it and says, no, give your heads a shake, right? So, you said, you know, you, yeah. you, you don't believe uranium's an issue. Everybody knows it's an issue. Put it in there. So it comes back to my desk and I go, oh, put it in and do the calculations. Right. So right? those seven drill holes that were found to have measurable uranium, to me, that's, that's saying, you know what, don't, don't, you don't have to hide it. If it's there, it's there. If it's in the ground, no. people have a right to know. I mean, it, it, and then you we say measurable amounts that are safe limits and things like that. On a small child growing up in it for 23 years, how do we know for sure? There are background concentrations of metals everywhere on the planet. That's largely what the crust mm -hmm. is made up of. So it, is it something that's there at a concentration that's higher than background? That might be an issue. Mm -hmm. The other component that you have to think about is if it's tightly bound in a piece of rock and that gets ingested, if that rock is never digested, it just comes right out the other end, right? We don't make that assumption. We make the assumption that everything that goes in gets absorbed into the body. It's the respiratable, that the 2 p.m. 2.5 that gets into the lungs and then through that into the bloodstream. That's, that route, that's another route for exposure, certainly. Yeah. Right. That would be, yeah. That would be one. Key one that right? would be concerning. Well, your ingestion exposures are likely to be much higher. Hmm. Okay? So that would be a much larger route of exposure. Typically, that's the way it works. The inhalation exposures to metals and dust particulates are usually about a thousand times lower than what you get from, from, from dust. So what's on, your, dust. what's on your cucumbers in your backyard? Well, what's on your cucumbers in your backyard? Like or if you've got young kids, you know they taste test everything. Oh, yes. Right? Yeah. So the hands that's are on right. the ground. And yeah. And okay. that's where the soil ingestion comes. Well, I appreciate what you said about, um, 
you know, like that all those things are taken into consideration. My, my concern would be the cumulative thing, and also that this list is is not on the shy side, but on the thorough side of what's right. there. Right. Thank you. Yeah. That Sorry. that decision does not event, it ultimately lie with us. Okay, I'm going to politely cut you off yeah, here thanks. because we've got five minutes left. We're going to take this question here directly to this presenter while I ask the other presenters to come up here to the table so that if there's other questions that need to be directed to either of the, or the presentations that we're ready for that. I think the line of commentary here actually goes to why the integrated health impact assessment works slightly differently than the spoke and wheel model that you're describing, where you get information from another wing of the assessment separately. Just a, a comment. I was wondering on your baseline, uh, the 20% rule, do you follow your own data so that there's reliability of that measurement of 20% increase? And over time, who does that? Right, right now, you're a consultant hired for the project. Is the government going to retain you to do the post-exposure baseline reevaluations? Certainly, part of the project. This will be a monitoring program to make sure that all of the predictions that have come from air quality, water quality, and the HHERA are in fact either reasonable or in fact over predicting what's actually going on. That's the only way that that can be done. So monitoring programs to make sure that the predictions are in fact over predictions has to be part of the project as it progresses. So let's the only suppose way to the that. curve is going up and your monitoring program is suggesting a trajectory of within the 23 years uh, that we will be exceeding 20%. Will the project be shut down? I can't, uh, I can't answer that. My guess mm -hmm. is that if that looked to be the case, mitigative measures would be put in place to make sure that that did not happen. Are there any other mine sites in Canada that have done this pre and post and successfully evaluated the baseline having not changed or 20% therefore a shutdown has occurred? Uh, I'm not aware of any, um, but that doesn't mean it hasn't been done. And lastly, the Interior Health uh, authority was unable to fulfill its obligations as the consultant support to this project and had to step back in May of 2012, mm -hmm. June 2012. They've just recently reestablished some involvement as of May 2013. Um, they said that it was too big a project for their manpower. And if the government is putting in place the evaluation for health impacts, who are they going to fund? Because currently in Interior Health, we're looking for $11 million cutbacks, and we don't have enough money to operate right now. So our public health officers were unable to fulfill their obligation. Sorry, the question Who's going to do your 20% increase monitoring job and have the integration with health impact? I, I have no idea which arm of government will take that on, whether it's federal or provincial or some combination thereof. Uh, there will be a, uh, some kind of uh, monitoring, but who's going to be doing it? I have no idea. All right, thank you. So we have all of the presenters up front on the panel, and I would now open the floor and the mic for you to direct any of your questions towards the individuals. I have a request from all of you, and I'd be quite happy to pay for them, but I found this very helpful, very informative, um, but hard to follow all of it. I'm a lay person, I'm not a scientist, I'm, I'm just a mother and a grandmother, etc. What I'd like is a copy of the overheads if the presenters would share them. And as I say, I'd be happy to pay for them. Is that a possibility? Yes, we'll, we'll be posting all of the presentations on our website. And we'll make some uh, uh, printed copies available at our office. Thank you very much. Thanks, Yves. 
Other questions? I would uh, just like to commend uh, the mine for putting this on, and I would encourage everybody to let the process unfold. And um, it's obviously a very rigorous process, probably more rigorous than than what the nation's ever seen in the past. It's getting more rigorous every day. And um, to the experts at the table, uh, I think you did an excellent job, and uh, just encourage this kind of thing more in the future. Thank you. Thank you. If we don't have any further questions, do we have any comments? Hearing none, Yves, maybe you would like to come up and uh, pass along some closing remarks. staff would like to thank you for coming here tonight there were some really good questions we had uh, Robert sitting in the corner captured all of the questions that were here uh, were asked here tonight uh, we will do our best to uh, answer all of these questions and share them with the public through our website and again we thank you all for attending the session here tonight and feel free to come again uh, on Tuesday Wednesday or Thursday but we will be having those presentations posted on our website at some point this week, hopefully. It's a pretty busy week for our team, but uh, I do commit to you that we will have them posted. Thank you very much, everyone.